one of the things that happens when you've been preaching for a number of years is you forget what stories you've told or where you've told them. So I know I've told this story before. I don't remember if I said it here or not, but I know there's also a lot of new people who uh, probably have not heard this before. Um, you wouldn't know it to look at me right now, but when I was like grade nine, I was a tiny kid. Uh, I was short and I was skinny. Well, skinny-ish. Uh, I was, you know, the perfect size to fit inside a school locker. Um, and unfortunately, also the perfect size to be slammed up against it every time you walk past people. Uh, and so in grade nine, uh, I was bullied a little bit. There was, there was this one hallway that I, I knew if I walked down it, I was going to get shoved into a locker, maybe literally, um, certainly up against a locker. And, you know, a, a couple years passed, and I ended up changing schools because I wanted to go to a different school that had a football team. And uh, something interesting happened. I, I kind of grew this way, and I grew this way. Since then, I've been growing this way, but that's a different story. <laughs> and I, I learned how to play football, and I was, I was good at it. I mean, this is kind of humble brag here, but um, actually, I think this is bragging. Uh, I, I was good. My, my thing, I mean, I was, I was fairly quick, and, and, you know, I had a fair size, but my thing was I would catch anything you threw at me. You know, if, you, if, if I could get my hand on it, I only dropped two passes ever in my high school career. Everything else, I, I pulled it in. I was, like, known for it. Um, and it became like the thing that I loved to do. My, my friends and I, you know, we'd, we'd have our school team, but then all through the year, no matter what, we were Sunday after church, you know, after lunch, we would be on the football field, rain, what is it, rain, sleet, snow, hail, doesn't matter. We're, we're like the mailmen of football. And so we would be out there no matter what. And this one Sunday, we get there and there's already people on the field. And there's already a game going on. And we think, oh, cool, you know, like, it's always good to have more people, and we'll go join them. And we get there, and who's on the field but my old bullies? And like that, I was that little skinny boy again. And I just felt like, oh, man, like, as soon as I realized who it was, I was thinking, should I tell my guys we should go somewhere else? Because, you know, I don't want to play here with these guys. Like, I just, I don't want to get mixed up with these guys again. Um, but I didn't say that, and we, we joined the thing, and so what they did is they did like the schoolyard pick em thing, right? They lined everybody up on one side, and they already had the teams that they thought were fair, and so the captain of each team started picking. And they picked this guy, and this guy, and this guy. And I was the absolute last one picked. And again, I just felt like this little kid again. But then an interesting thing happened. They snapped the ball the first play, and they threw to the guy who you know, I was supposed to cover. Probably they realized that I was that little kid and they think, oh yeah, here's the guy we can continue to pick on. He was in the open field and I nailed him. All right, we played full body contact, no pads, no helmet. It, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, but let me tell you, it felt good. <laughs> it felt good. It wasn't cheaper like that, but uh, my body just took over and it realized I was no longer that little kid. I was a big kid now. I was big enough to be able to handle my own. And uh, I had fun that day. Um, you know, we, I, I had a day, let's just say that, right? <laughs> Scoring touchdowns, catching people, tackling people, it was good. Uh, we agreed to show up the next week, and the next week, I was picked first. <laughs> I imagine that we can all understand something about that feeling. It hurts when you're not chosen. It hurts to be, you know, and... and High school football doesn't matter at all when you're talking about things that really matter. Like, you're up for a position, you put your resume in, you're hoping to get this job, and you don't even get a call back. Or, or like, you give your heart to somebody, and it's just like, you're here, and they take it, and they just spike it. It hurts when you're not chosen. But it feels so good when you are. It feels so good when, when you are picked the interesting thing about this is that we didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose us. I talked about this a little bit last week. You know, most rabbis of Jesus' day, they would walk up, you know, they, they, they would not approach someone. They would wait to be approached. And then they would decide if you were good enough to be able to be their student. Well, Jesus totally flipped that around. And he went up to people who were not chosen by anybody else. And he said, I want you to follow me. And speaking to his disciples, and I think to us as well, he said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. And this is one of the foundational stones of our faith. If it came down to, to me, if it came down to you, 
we could not feel very secure about our faith because we know that as much as we might try, we're, we're too unstable to set the foundation of our faith on ourselves. But God chose us. And so we are doing this series called Foundations. Uh, we're studying the book of Romans, which is a, a letter Paul wrote to the Romans before he ever went there. And basically his way of saying, if I don't get there, this is what you need to know. This is the foundation of our faith. These, these are the important things. Uh, and it's kind of like the foundation of a house. You know, before you start thinking about, you know, what wallpaper to put on the room or anything like that, you better make sure that your foundation is solid. Because if your foundation isn't solid, it doesn't really matter what else comes on top of it. And so that's why we're doing this, this series. Like, this is what you need to know. This is the important stuff. And the foundational stone I want you to know today is that I've been chosen by God. I don't have to understand why. I just need to glorify. And if I was, you know, a preacher in the South, I would get all excited and make it, you know, sound like rhymey, but, you know, I don't understand why. I just need to glorify. Something like that. But it just, it feels weird, and I think you would think it was weird too. So just understand that you've been chosen by God. If you are a follower of Christ, you have been chosen by God. Jesus said, I didn't, you know, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And you don't have to understand why. You just have to glorify. Hopefully that'll make sense as we finish up. But today we're into uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11. And it's a lot. It is a lot. And so I'm not necessarily going to go through it verse by verse. Um, you can do that on your own. But we're going to cover the, the entire section uh, and, and the ideas behind them at least. So Paul starts Romans 9 by saying, With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. I mean, he, he's basically saying, I want you to understand that this, what I'm saying is true and, and don't question it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and un, unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I mean, Paul grew up as a good law-abiding Jew. In fact, he was more zealous than most. You know, he, other places he goes through his resume and it's like, okay, he had the credentials. He, he was a strong Jewish person, but his heart is filled with grief and bitter sorrow because they're lost. And he says something amazing. Like, Paul's a better person than I am because I, I couldn't say this. I'm sorry, I couldn't. He says, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Maybe I'm not pastoral enough, but I, I find that hard to even comprehend. This idea that says, I'm going to take you know, my, my eternal life and say, I'd be willing to give that up just so that these people could be saved. I mean, Paul has is, is got such a heart for his people. He says, they are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. I mean, you read through the, the Old Testament, you know, the, the book of Genesis and Exodus, and you see what God did to show his people uh, his, who he was and his glory. I mean, there's, he literally appeared in a cloud of fire and a, and a cloud of smoke that, that represented his glory to show his people that he was with them. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them. He gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. I mean, they had so much going for them. And Paul says, but now they're lost. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors. Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned, and he is God. I mean, that is a, that is a huge Trinity statement. All right, if you go to the next slide here, you'll see. Um, oh, sorry, maybe I'm ahead. Uh, I have two that are the same. All right, there's one with a little Trinity triangle. There's not. I left that part out. All right, you guys might be familiar with the Trinity triangle. You know, it... it <laughs> It looks kind of like this, all right? And it's got, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Now, God the Father is not God the Son. God the Son is not God the Spirit. God the Spirit is not God the Father, and yet they are all God. And so, again, this is a thing that, we, you know, we will never be able to fully wrap our mind around it. God is three, but God is one. Um, the, the hu math doesn't work, human speaking, but it does with, with God's math. But here, Paul is saying, you know, if, if anyone ever questioned wh where Paul's stance was on Christ's divinity, he's saying Jesus is God. I mean, that's a huge statement right there, because a lot of people will say, yeah, Jesus was a great teacher, everything like that, but he never claimed to be God. No one ever claimed, the early church didn't. Claim. Right here in the book to Romans, one of the foundational things, Jesus is God. The one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise, Amen. 
So in the midst of Paul writing about you know, his, his, his people and saying, I have such a heart for them, but they're lost, they don't recognize that Jesus is God. He says, well then, has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? No, for not all people who are born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. For the scriptures say, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted, though Abraham had other children too. This means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. Only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. For God has promised, I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. So again, we're going back into Old Testament history here. In the book of Genesis, God said, I am going to give you, he said to Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth through you. I'm going to give you descendants like, like sand on the seashore, like stars in the sky. And at this point, Abraham had no children and he was, he was old. And so God saying to you, I'm, I'm going to promise you that you are going to have a child and it's, you know, it's, there's going to be like these, the descendants, the children of the promise. Now, if you go through the, the story, you know Abraham had a, a child that wasn't the way that God wanted him to have it. You know, he, he, he can read the story, but he went outside of, of God's rules there. And that son was his descendant, but wasn't a child of the promise. You know, God, God said, no, I, am, I promise you I'm going to come back. Sarah is going to have a child. You know, not, not Sarah's handmaiden, which is the, the way, again, I, I don't want to go into that whole history of the story. Um, read Genesis, you'll understand it. He's just saying, you know, you try to do it your own way, I want you to do it my way. And, and both of them are your children, but only one of them is the child of the promise. And so not everyone who is a descendant of Abraham is a child of the promise. Only those who are children by faith, as, as we're going to come to understand here. Verse 10, this son was our ancestor Isaac. When he married Rebekah, he gave birth to twins. Before they were born, before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God. This message shows that God's, God chooses people according to his own purposes. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. All right, so before these children had done anything, God chose one and rejected the other, which is hard for us to understand. She was told, your older son will serve your younger son, which was not the normal way. In the words of scripture, I loved Jacob, but I rejected Esau. Other translations say I hated Esau. I think rejected is actually a better translation. And so you've got these two children, both you know, descendants of Abraham, and yet God is choosing for his own purposes, not because of anything they've done, because they're, they're still in the womb, they haven't done anything, and yet he's saying, I'm choosing to put my blessing on this one, and I'm rejecting the other one. Why? If you know the answer, come tell me, because I don't. I don't know the answer to that. Are we saying then that God was unfair? He asks a good question here, because he anticipates that people are going to ask that question. I mean, it sounds unfair to me. And he says, of course not. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. God's saying, I'm going to show mercy on who I will show mercy. I will show compassion on who I will show compassion. It's up to me to decide. And so it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. For the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you from the very purpose of display, for the very purpose of displaying my power in you to spread my fame throughout the earth. It, it, God is saying, you know, I lifted Pharaoh up simply so that I could bring him down to show my own glory. And again, I think to myself, is that fair? And God's response is simply like, who are you to even ask? It's up to me to decide who I show mercy to and who I show compassion to. If you're uncomfortable right now, that's good. That's, that's fine. That's okay. I am too. So you see that God chooses to show mercy to some and he chooses to harden the hearts of others so that they refuse to listen. This is a difficult teaching. I, I'm fully aware of that. Well, then you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he made them do? No, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to argue with God? I mean, he said the same thing to Job, right? Should the thing that was created say to the one who, was, who created it, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have the right to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another to throw garbage into? I mean, could you, could you imagine, like, if, if your clay could talk? 
And the potter takes some and says, okay, I'm going to make this into a beautiful thing that I'm going to use in, in worship service. You know, maybe I'll make like a, a communion cup or a table or something like that. And the other part he just puts together and says, oh, this is for a wastebasket. For the clay to say, whoa, 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 that's not fair. It's ridiculous when you say it that way. It's, it's just clay. And God is so much above us and so different and separate from us that it's the same kind of thing. He's the potter, we're the clay, and what he decides goes. And we don't have even the right to, to question him. In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he is very patient with those on whom his anger falls, who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who were prepared in advance for glory. And we are among those whom he selected, both from the Jews and the Gentiles. Now this term here, destined for destruction, it, again, it sounds so harsh. Like, like God is creating people and they're destined for destruction. Now, um, one of the commentary, I went through a lot of commentary for this. One of the commentaries said, you know, it's, it's not that God even had to destine them for destruction. People do that on their, on their own. God creates them, but we ourselves, like all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. And it's just, there, even as I'm going here, you know, I wasn't even going to go into this, but I don't understand how, how God's omniscience and his omnipotence comes into play in this, this scenario. Like God knew before he created even the first, before he even said, let there be light, God knew every single person he was going to create. He knew all the things they were going to do. He knew whether they would choose to accept him or reject him. But apparently that, that doesn't come into play here. He had the power and the ability to know all these things, but God in his, on his own ability, his own power, just sort of said, I'm still choosing to, to make it happen. I'm up here saying I don't understand it. Okay? Charles Spurgeon, when a woman said, I don't understand how God could, could love Jacob, but hate Esau. And he said that his response was... Um, that's not my difficulty. He said, my trouble is to understand how God could love Jacob. You know, she said, how, how come God could hate Esau? And he says, that aside, how could he love Jacob? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God chooses to love us even though we do not deserve it. So when the, the word here says destined for destruction, it, I don't even have to get mad with God for that. I know that, that if it's me, I did that to myself. I know that anyone who's destined for destruction did the things that caused them to be destroyed. And then Paul goes through this, the, this next section, and he's quoting the Old Testament prophets, Hosea and Isaiah, to show that, that God had some of his children who would stray. God, God said, some of my, my, some of my children, the Israelites, are going to stray. And then there's others who aren't my children, you know, the, the Gentiles, who are going to become my children. And so Paul is just sort of setting the entire scene, saying, I, I love my people. I have, I have this heart for Israel, and yet even if you look through all of the history, God, God himself said, you know, there are some of, of my, um, Paul's brothers, who are going to stray away, and there's some Gentiles who are going to become part of the family. That's just, that's just the way it's going to be. And so as much as Paul cares for his people, he knows that this is the way it, the way it is. Verse 30 says, so what does all this mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in him. They stumbled over the great rock in their path. God warned them of this in the scriptures when he said, I'm placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. And so you've got God's chosen people I do that every week. I've got God's chosen, you've got God's chosen people, and some are going to choose to follow him through faith. Some are going to try to do their own way and try to earn God's salvation by following the law. And then you've got some Gentiles who are going to, you know, do things their own way and ignore God. You've got some Gentiles who will come to faith in Jesus. And so Paul's basically saying this entire thing and say, it doesn't matter if you're an offspring of Abraham. It doesn't matter if you're an offspring of Jacob. 
It doesn't matter, you know, any of this kind of thing. What really matters is do you have faith in Jesus? That is, that, that's the test to, by which you know if you are a child of the promise or not. He starts Romans 10 by saying, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I mean, he's made this clear. He loves his people. He wants for them to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law has been given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. So God gave us a law to point to Christ, you know, to a way of saying, you need something outside of yourself. No one can live and fulfill the law on, a, on their own. And so this law really was pointing to Christ, but some choose to ignore Christ and worship the law. It is only by those, those who follow Jesus who will be made right with God. And when I read about this part about misdirected zeal, it made me think, you know, he's talking about, you know, Jews and Gentiles. Let's talk about today. Um, there's a term called progressive. You know, there are some people who will say, well, I'm a progressive. And that may be you as well. And I might step on your toes here right now, okay? My issue with uh, the term progressive is that I don't think it's always progress. And I think there's a lot of misdirected zeal that says, you know, we, we want to go and, and be making progress but if it's not following God's rule, then you're not really progressing. And, and often I find the term divergent is actually better. And so it, it's only progress if you're headed in the right direction. And so if you are saying, I need to, we need to progress and follow God's word and, and do what Jesus wants us to do, by all means, that's good. You don't have to be a progressive, that's just being a Christian. But if you turn away from what God's law says and said, you know, we've got to make progress and we've got to do the things that, that the world is going to find more acceptable, then you are no longer progressing the way you're supposed to be. It's misdirected zeal. You know, I, I understand that you're saying, I want to do what's right, but if your guideline for what is right is what the world says is right instead of what God says is right, then you're no longer making progress. You are heading in the wrong direction. And the longer you head in that direction, the harder it might actually be to get back to making progress towards what God says. So make sure your zeal, you know, make sure your, your energy is put in the right direction. And the way we determine that is always, always, always going to be what does God's word say? And if it doesn't line up with that, follow it if you want, but you're not making progress. So Paul goes on then to talk more about the law and, and really the, the, this idea of the law is it's all about me. It's all about trying to do it on my own power, which he's already proven throughout the whole book of Romans that that's impossible. You cannot do it. And he says it all comes down to this, verse 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will, you will be saved. So understand, he's saying not if you follow God's law to the, to the T. No. It's actually, that's impossible. Jesus fulfilled God's law so that now we put our faith in him. And if you openly declare, if you confess with your mouth, you, you, if you, confession is basically saying agreement with a statement. So if you agree with Jesus that he is who he said he is, and you, you believe that Jesus is Lord, and you believe that in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. That's, that's the core. That's the idea of whether you're a Christian or not. If you can declare that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe that, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. So Jew and Gentile are the same in this, re in, in this respect. So if we're talking about who is chosen, it doesn't matter, again, if you're a child of Abraham, or if you are a, a, a Gentile, or a Greek, or other translation you want to say. It doesn't matter if you're a Jewish person or not a Jewish person. It all comes down to whether or not you accept Jesus. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is all about Jesus. And he says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him unless they have never heard, unless they have heard, of, sorry, how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? I mean, Paul's just using logic here. It's, 
it's important for, for these, thing, these steps to happen. Someone cannot become a Christian. They cannot declare that Jesus is Lord if they don't hear about him, if, they don't, if they're not preached to in a sense. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. I've talked before about this being like a spiritual pedicure. Like when you think about feet, they're nasty. Feet are gross. Like mine are gross. You know, I've got dry skin on my feet and sometimes they crack and sometimes they smell. And I can certainly tell you, you know, teenagers' feet smell. Sorry, guys. Feet are gross. But let me give you a scenario. You are drowning. You're drowning in a lake. And someone comes by and, and you know, the, the boat is so far down that all they can do is they, they grab onto the side and they, they put di- their foot down to save you. And they say, grab hold of my foot. And they got these nasty, blistery, toe-gubbin-looking things. Are you really going to, like, and you're drowning. Are you really going to be like, no, nah, I'll wait for the next one. I'll do it on my own. Or would that foot, as nasty as it is, look like the most beautiful thing you could imagine? Would you not grab it with both hands and hold it to you as tight as you could? Because how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel, who bring salvation to you? But Paul tells us not everyone welcomes the good news. And he spends the rest of the chapter explaining that Israel has heard and understood the message, but they've been rebellious and disobedient. He's basically saying they're like kids. You'd be like, nah, I'm not listening. They've heard, they've understood, but they choose not to listen. In fact, if you read through the book of Acts, when, when Stephen is stoned, he's telling them all about Jesus, and they literally, it says, they covered their ears and yelled. It's, it's, they're like the kids going, nah, nah, nah. You know, they don't want to hear it. They hear it, they understand it, but they don't want to listen to it. Romans 11, 1. I ask then, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? Of course not. It says, I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. No, God has not rejected his own people whom he chose from the very beginning. Do you realize what the scriptures say about this? Um, Elijah, the prophet, complained to God about the people of Israel and said, Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me. And do you remember God's reply? He said, no, I have 7,000 others who have never bowed down to Baal. In other words, you know, has God rejected his people? No, because Paul himself is an Israelite. There are other Israelites who have accepted Jesus. Even in the day of Elijah, when he thought he was the only one left, God said, I've saved 7,000 people who have never bowed down to the, the false god. God has not rejected his people. He's chosen to keep some of them. And he's chosen to bring others in. It is the same today, for a few of the people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace, his undeserved kindness in choosing them. And since it is through God's kindness, then it is not by their good works, for in that case, God's grace would not be what it really is, free and undeserved. Again, not about what I can do, not about my own ability to to maintain the law. It's all about what Jesus has done and me putting my faith in him. So this is the situation, verse 7. Most of the people of Israel, and it's so sad here that he says most, but he says, most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God they are looking for so earnestly. A few have, the ones God has chosen, but the hearts of the rest were hardened. As the, script, as the scriptures say, God has put them into a deep sleep. To this day, he has shut their eyes so, that you, so they do not see and closed their ears so they do not hear. And again, if this makes you uncomfortable, I understand. I don't understand how microwaves work. You might be thinking, did he skip a page here? No. Um, I, this is what I'm wanting to do. I have no idea how this thing works. All I know is you plug it in, you, you push a button, and something happens. Someone here, a lot smarter than me, might be able to explain it to me. But I don't know. I've, I've never, never looked into it, I've never studied it, never tried to figure it out. But I do know If I put this magic bag in there and I spin this dial, let's say 150, and I hit start, it starts making noise.
I don't understand why God would choose some and reject others. I don't. It's, it strikes me as unfair. And yet, I, even when I say that, I recognize that my idea of fairness comes from an almighty Father in heaven who is good. Right? He is the one who, who, who says what is right and what is wrong. And so my understanding of what is fair is based on him and his goodness. And yet, I don't understand why he would reject some and choose others. I just, I don't get it. I don't understand why, he, why or how many hearts he's hardened. You know, he, the, the scripture tells us that he's hardened some hearts, but we don't know how many, and we don't know why. I don't know how God's omniscience or omnipotence falls into all this, you know, this idea that he knew before time what I was going to do, and yet still chose me, and, and yet my actions didn't have any bearing on his choice. I don't understand it. I just trust that it works. I don't understand the microwave. I just trust that it works. Verse 17. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branch, branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. I mean, this is amazing imagery. And I, I, again, I, I'm not an arborist. I don't know how these things work. But apparently you can, you can chop off a branch, take a branch from another tree, and stick it in. Apparently you can actually do this with like different types of fruit. And it'll still produce the, the kind of fruit that it originally was. I don't know. But you were branches from a wild olive tree. You've been grafted in. So th- those of you who do not have a Jewish uh, origin... You're like a wild olive tree. But you've been grafted into God's family. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised in Abraham, or to Abraham to his, and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in or, replace the, or, or be, brag about being the one to replace the branches that were broken off. You're just a branch. You're not the root. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ, and you are there because you do believe. It really has nothing to do with you. It has to do with God choosing you to believe in his Son. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He's severe towards those who disobeyed, but kind to you, if you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you will also be cut off. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You, by nature, were a branch cut from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you into his cultivated tree, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. Now again, I read through this section and the rest of this chapter, and I'm left with more questions than answers. And I wish I could stand up here and tell you this is exactly what it means. I can't. I don't know why I was chosen and someone else may have been cut off. I I don't understand it, but I trust God. And I know that that may be unsatisfactory for some of you. And I'm sorry about that. But I think Paul felt the same way. I think if Paul was up here, he may be saying the same kind of thing because he ends the chapter with this. Verse 33, he said, Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. I mean, Paul's the one writing all this stuff, and he seems to be saying at the end, I don't know. I can't understand it. None of us can. Who could know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. And so I finish off here, kind of where we started. I've been chosen by God and I don't understand why. I just need to glorify. I've been chosen by God. I don't have to understand why. But my response is simply to bring glory to God. I need to choose to be humble and recognize that when I don't understand God's ways. He tells us in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I don't have to understand. I just have to trust that he is great and he knows better. When we don't understand something that God does, we have the choice to let that become a stumbling block and get in the way of our spiritual growth or we have the choice to say that I may not understand this but I trust that God is good and he knows better than I do. You, you have the choice right now to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to let this get in my way. I don't understand it and I'm, I'm going to fight against it and, if, and I'm going to let it push me away from God. Or you have the option to say, I don't understand it and it really wants to make me learn more about God. It's going to draw me in. And again, the choice is yours. But no matter what, the key here is Jesus. It all comes down to whether or not you are willing to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Everything else, I'm leaving that up to God. I simply want to put my faith in him. I can't tell you, I can't tell you why God has chosen me, but I can tell you that I am so glad that he did.